When I found out that they have been able to actually get these original effects, I thought I needed to get my hands on these. Wake up, Mr. Freeman. We are on. Priority alert. Nova If Half-Life 3 is ever gonna become a thing, I think Valve should take a look at your work. <laughs> that would not be possible, even if I wanted it to. How so? Um... The robots arrive in three, two... What? The origin story of the podcast. So how did that all start? I never had the thoughts of having a podcast. Now suddenly it's been going on for four years and 48 episodes and wow. <laughs> what do you think are the key qualities that make a successful voice actor? A successful voice actor should be versatile. We should be able to do all sorts of voices, accents, dialects. One very important part of the voiceover is if you've ever played any of the Half-Life mods, chances are you've heard Ronald Hamrack's voice. Ronald is an aspiring voice actor, mostly known for his work on the Half-Life mods, where he voices the Overwatch voice and many other characters in the Half-Life series. We talk about how he started acting at a very early age and how that has morphed into voice acting. We also talk about his strategy of piercing into the voice acting scene without any experience. Apart from being a talented voice actor, Ronald is also the host of the amazing Vogue podcast, a podcast dedicated to voice acting. He talks to various voice actors and industry leaders about voice acting and working for various games. If you're interested in voice acting or interested in listening to voice actors talk about their experience, I definitely recommend you check out the Vogue podcast. And with that said, let's uncover Ronald's story. Ronald, uh, such a pleasure to have you here on the show. Thank you very much for finding the time. Uh, I'm very excited to chat. Um, and I'd like to, you know, start our conversation by, uh, you know, it, it'll only make sense to start this conversation by rewinding the clock just back a little bit. Um, obviously, like many of us or many people who are, who are listening to this podcast, you're into uh, video games. But honestly, what I want to start with is something that I found quite fascinating about you is your interest in the science behind computers and electronics, which is very interesting. And that's what I want to talk about first. And how exactly did that interest develop? And is that a hobby that you practice to this day? Well, to be honest, the story behind that is not that interesting. I, as a kid, used to play a lot of video games, and mainly the Half-Life stuff and Grand Theft Auto. But uh, there's been times when our computer was malfunctioning, and then we had engineers and mechanics come over and take a look at it. And, and I, as the excited kid who already just wanted to play games, I used to stay there and watch as these uh, workmen were doing their best to fix it. And so I just learned a thing or two from them and you know how to install windows and stuff so that's pretty much the the story of that does the hobby continue to this day do you like uh building a pc or do you open up uh, certain electronics to see how they work or anything like that oh no 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 <laughs> not that not no? that <laughs> talk to me about some of the, some of your favorite games then what are what are some of your favorite games that you enjoy playing well definitely some of those valve games you know uh, left for dead 2 of course, yeah. yeah. Portal, uh, Half Life, um, yeah. Those are the main games. But I also do Resident Evil sometimes. So definitely, those games are my kind of cup of coffee. Resident Evil definitely uh, is pretty big. Obviously, anything that Valve does is is pretty huge as well. Anything um, modern? Anything that came out lately and recently? Have you played something interesting? Not really. I'm really a retro kid when it comes to video games and uh, music and that kind of stuff. <laughs> About the music, I know. <laughs> We're going to get into that. All right. That's uh, that's very interesting, uh, which, you know, uh, makes... Perfect sense to, to ask my next question, which is exactly about music. So obviously you enjoy singing and uh, obviously you do that pretty well. Um, and it's safe to say that your favorite... Uh, uh, band is modern talking and i and i'm guilty of listening to them every once in a while as well because they are pretty awesome that's for sure but what i find quite interesting and what i want to get your opinion on 
is that I noticed that, you know, quite a few actors or, you know, mainly voice actors are, you know, very uh, passionate about singing as well. Um, I'm not going to name any names because, uh, the, the, you know, there's quite a few of them, but what do you think? Is there a connection there between the art of voice acting and acting and singing, or is it, you know, some personal preference uh, and just a hobby? Well, you've definitely got the modern talking part, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> it is uh, very convenient when an actor can sing, and as a lot of times, you know, it may come in handy. As a matter of fact, especially in, you know, the Disney movies, the animated stuff where they often tend, you know, to do musicals, there is uh, important for the voiceover artist to be able to sing and in the voice of the character. But the singing to me personally is just um, something like a hobby that uh, I do in my free time and I really enjoy. Do you practice it in any way? Do you have any experience, like any, any prof professional, I mean, maybe you were taught to sing or something? Not professional experience. I just uh, usually do it at home. Yeah. Um, I record some covers and that kind of stuff, but I have never, you know, taken a voice lesson or anything like that. Well, that's interesting because you do that pretty well. And uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you take a few lessons, you're going to get even better. Well, I appreciate um, it. Well, let's talk about, you know, uh, a bit of your acting experience, right? And what's uh, very interesting is that your first, you know, on camera acting ex experience was uh, when you were only 10 years old. Um, and as you have mentioned, it was something that was not really interesting for you and you were not really passionate about it at that specific age. But, you know, despite, despite that, you still did it. Um, you know, what does it feel like to act at 10 years old when you really, you know, don't really care about your performance where, when in reality you're just having fun and how does that feeling compare to acting, you know, today when, uh, you know, you're acting, actually you care about your acting and you care how well you perform. Uh, you see, back then it was something, something new for me. Since my brother was, you know, involved in the making of amateur movies, I found it interesting. Um, me in a movie, <laughs> I had to try it. But after <laughs> that, you know, one experience, I haven't really continued on as a kid, uh, filming a movie in general is very complicated and time consuming. I had other hobbies at the time. Playing video games was my go-to. Um, so I wasn't going to fool around outside for hours when I could enjoy my favorite video games in the comfort of my own room. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that for sure. But uh, how, how, like, did you get paid for that role? No, no. Um, no, right? no. The story behind a... that is my brother had a friend who had... Um, <laughs> Uh, been an aspiring director and uh, his dream was to become uh, a, an actual director in Slovakia and make actual movies um, and uh, he did that by doing amateur movies but he also didn't have any um, um, well he didn't study it first of all he was just uh, doing it you know for fun and uh, trying to become someone yeah so yeah that's how I kind of got started Understood. But uh, just to, to go back to my question, uh, how does acting, you know, as a kid compare to acting now? Um, and we could also relate that to, to voiceover work, right? Because at the, at the end of the day, it's also, uh, um, you know, an aspect of acting. So now that you're older and more mature and in a way, one of your, you know, life uh, directions and careers is voice acting. How, do, how does it compare as to when you're a kid, when there, you have no care in the world compared to now? It feels much more professional. You're trying to make sure your performance is on point, as opposed to back then, I was just, you know, having fun and just fooling around. But right now, when I, I get told, you know, the directions and what I'm supposed to do, it, it's, it's often a job for me. There are times when I volunteer, but even then I'm trying to give my best performance. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting, actually, because I, I'm pretty sure there's a big difference, you know, when uh, you do something as a kid and then when you grow up and you do it, you know, it, it, at least in my mind, it completely changes the landscape of things. But uh, tell me about your brother. Is he still uh, in into acting, into um, directing? Uh, well, you see, not exactly. Um, he kind of gave up on that, um, you know. Okay. He, he's been doing it for years, but... Uh, you know, mm -hmm. he ha he has a fiance now and he has three beautiful uh, cats. Uh, so now okay, he's rather nice. busy with the uh, work and family. So, yeah, he doesn't really have time gotcha. for filming. Gotcha. And that first movie, uh, is that the one, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but that's the one where you're in 
in complete makeup, correct? No, that is uh, well. That's a different one. That's a different one. There, there was one okay. where I was in complete makeup. That was later. That was later, like five yeah. years later. Yeah. But do Do you practice on camera acting to this day, or? We do it sometimes, um, because actually, my uh, the director that I was talking you about, telling you about that wasn't my brother. He had a friend, right? And my brother was just as an actor, you know, helping him out. So um, yeah, he still the director still does movies to this day, and he is improving and he's getting better and better. And I I work with him now, helping him out, volunteering, of course. No, that's really cool, man. That's really awesome. I've seen the two trailers that have come out uh, for the movie. I haven't seen the movie, obviously. Um, uh, because what, what character it, do you? Yeah, because it's in Slovakian, it may be difficult for people to watch it, but. Um, yeah, the newer movies, uh, to my knowledge, have uh, translation transcripts. So yeah, gotcha. And we can watch those uh, currently, right? Yes, you could. There also been talks of an English dub, but I'm not sure how far will that get. But that'd be amazing. Tell me, uh, do you have a preference between on camera work or voiceover work? Which which do you prefer, and why? Hmm, that's not really a hard question for me. I prefer voiceover definitely. I think I know the answer. Yeah, <laughs> definitely voiceover. It's much more of a right. fast-paced job. You know, I mean, you get your scripts, record what you're told. A lot of times, it can take up just about ten or twenty minutes, and I can do it, you know, uh, from my home studio. But on-camera acting, at least the movies I had experience with, have their own charm. You know, they're still fun. And you know you get to be around your friends, and over the years you get you know more used to working together with them as opposed to working together with someone new, especially in the film industry because you know in Hollywood you usually meet new people all the time, whatever project you're right. in. So you know here you don't get this bad feeling. You know just being around friends, it's fun. Um, but also you know. Uh, ha, um, when you happen to work with new people in you know whatever projects, it's it's kind of a motivation to do your best. So even when you might be a bit stressed, and you know to work with your new acting partners, it's a motivation to do your best and give your best performance in the role. Right, right. Oh man, I I, I can only imagine that. That's for sure. You mentioned a uh, home studio. Uh, I do know that yeah, you know, voice actors do tend to. Um, uh, you know, create or build their own home studios. Could you kind of describe what exactly does that mean, a home studio for voice uh, over work, for anybody interested perhaps in starting out? Well, um, it's difficult to um, answer because some voice actors, especially in the you know professional biz over there in the United States and wherever, uh, sometimes they have an actual full setup home studio. But... Um, there are some actors who cannot afford it, of course. So, um, honestly, whatever you have laying around at your home, uh, anything, even sheets or anything, or you can just buy some sheets from Amazon that you can, you know, put up wherever around you, sort of, which will, um, you know, uh, get make sure that it gets rid of the reverb and the echo and everything, and make sure. I mean, you need a good microphone, of course. So what you're saying is that uh, if if someone's on the on budget, um, a studio could, a professional studio for them could be a great mic and just kind of sound um, soundproofing your your surroundings, right? Kind of making your your whole environment friendly for the recording space. Um, Ronald, probably, uh, I'd like to touch upon probably the most interesting part um, of the conversation here, which is kind of the origin story of your passion and your interest in voice acting. And from what I gather, this all started in 2020 um, when you managed to get your hands on the post-processing files of the Overwatch voice from Half-Life 2. Um, and there's a really interesting story there that you kind of, you know, uh, described really briefly. Um, and I would like you to kind of dive into that story and expand it, uh, expand it a little bit um, and let us know what led you to pursue a career in acting and in voice acting. Um, and for those who might not know, what are post-processing files anyways? I never realized the story was that interesting behind all of this. <laughs> but now Correct. that you mention it, okay. So post-processing effects briefly are basically effects such as reverb, equalization, normalization, you know, back, removal of background noise 
all those effects, but in one file, which means you can load them into your sound editing program. And with one click, you can, you know, run all those in order. So instead of you having to apply all those effects separately, you can just do that with one easy click. Now, mm -hmm. the reason why post-processing effects are important in this story is because I am an Overwatch voice impersonator from Half-Life 2, the character. Uh, voiced by Ellen McLean originally, and what you need to know about it is that it's a character and their voice is coming out of a loudspeaker and or a radio. So effects are important in both cases. Attention residents, miscount detected in your block. Cooperation with your civil protection team permits full ration reward. And uh, there's this one guy named Christian Sabo who has been working on the Half-Life 2 Hungarian dub for over 10 years now. And uh, he is a sound engineer and actually these post-processing effects have been in the have been stored in the game files, but they have been for an older version of uh, Soundforge is, you know, that's what Valve worked with back in 2003 and the early 2000s. Anyway, Christian has managed to uh, get these effects work on a newer version of Soundforge and he has used it for, you know, their uh, rendition of Half-Life 2, the Hungarian version. And when I found out that they have been able to actually get these original effects work, because they are original, they are not a replication, they are OG. And at, at that mm -hmm. time I was already into mm, impersonating the character and trying to replicate the effects, you know, in audacity. Uh, however, I could, you know, echo, reverb, whatever, but I was, I sucked at it. I was terrible at it, but I did right. my best. <laughs> and when I heard this perfect, uh, you know, replication, replication, because it's OG, I thought I needed to get my hands on these and I tried. I reached out to, you know, Christian and he has gotten back to me and he has very, he was very kind. He explained to me exactly how to use them. I have, uh, you know, of course, bought Soundforge for it, uh, but uh, that was it. And I was very happy. I, I honestly, at the time, I just wanted it to fool around because my friends were working on a Half-Life mod, so I thought it'd be convenient. So I was just fooling around with it for some time until I actually started being in mods. So that's interesting. <laughs> that's really cool. So it kind of came, you know, uh, on a whim, really. You just kind of wanted to Definitely. dabble and see what you could do. You contacted Christian and he was uh, kind enough to, to send you the files. And from then on, you know... Uh, well, the rest is history, you could say, right? Exactly, <laughs> anyway. exactly. Oh, wow, that's that, that's really awesome. That's a, a, that's a really great story. And props to Christian, actually, for, for uh, sending you those files. Well done. Yeah, by all means, yeah. So you mentioned uh, Ellen McLean, right? And she she's obviously the voice of uh, Overwatch in, in Half-Life. Um, but what's interesting is you had her actually rate your performance. Um, in, in one of the videos, and I'll definitely showcase it um, here as we speak. Mission begins in 60 seconds. Mission begins in 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I am very impressed of the three impressions I have heard. Yours is the best. What was it like? to have, you know, Ellen McLean actually rate your performance uh, as the administrator from, you know, Team Fortress 2. It was amazing because, you know, I have actually met her a few times online when I was interviewing her, but right. uh, I think I have actually shown her my impression before, uh, like send it on Facebook or something, but it was never, never actually a live um, reaction, you know, so Okay. I, I couldn't actually know what she was thinking. So when Short, <laughs> you know, came out with this video, uh, I I was flattered. It was amazing to, you know, see Ellen uh, react. And, you know, that video will be, you know, here with us forever, probably. So I can rewatch it whenever right. I feel like, you know, I'm down and it'll give me positive uh, thoughts. Interesting that you mentioned that it's going to be there forever, which is, you know, something that I did think about that you can actually go and rewatch and feel the feeling again and again. But you know what was really cool, what I uh, thought from the video is that she remains in character throughout the whole video. 
like she just remains in character and she's so cool and she's so nice and uh, you know just the fact that she did this because she didn't have to do it right she could have just been herself but she actually was the character and i think that's just awesome from from someone like her and i can assume for you it must have felt you know absolutely amazing so oh yeah i was uh, all over the top (laughs) (laughs) and that video got a lot of views i don't don't recall the exact number but it's it's pretty high (laughs) it was a lot yeah yeah it was a lot it was a great video obviously for sure i definitely recommend to check uh to check it out for anybody yeah props to to shork for that yeah you know so obviously a lot of your work voiceover work let's say revolves around half-life and you know the modding community and the half-life mods Uh, talk to me about how you managed to connect with you know the half-life modding community and then also how do you manage to connect with the half-life you know uh, actors, because, um, you know, you talk to them a lot on your podcast and we're definitely going to get into that. It's a wonderful podcast that you have. Uh, so tell me about that. How did you get involved in, in the community? Well, uh, you know, after I got my hands on the post-processing effects, I immediately wanted to work. And, uh, you know, my best way to do that was going up and looking up some mods on ModDB, which is the database of mods. And uh, obviously, I found some pretty cool mods there. And, you know, I reached out to the um, creators, which is pretty unprofessional looking back at it right now. But at the time, I thought it was pretty cool. So I got some, you know, jobs here and there as the Overwatch because I didn't want to do anything else. And I didn't have a mic. All I had is a fo- was a phone. But at the time, it worked because, you know, the character was, the voice was coming out of a loudspeaker. So it, it was okay. Um, Later on, when I got a mic, I actually thought maybe I could, you know, do some other voices as well. So I started impersonating scientists from Half-Life and, you know, the uh, security guards (laughs) and, you know, whatever else I could do in a Half-Life mod, the G-Man and whatnot. I, I did all I could to get, you know, as close to the voices as possible. But when it comes to the actors and how I connected with them, it's thanks to my podcast. Um, so, yeah. You know, when you say you you think it was unprofessional to contact the the, um, uh, the modders, why would you say so? Why do you think it's unprofessional? Now, maybe when I think about it, it's not that unprofessional, but it's just, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, the fact that um, reaching out to people so that you can get work, you know, Maybe mm, they're not even looking for voices at the time. And you're just, you know, reaching out to them and maybe becoming quite of an annoyance or whatever. Anyway, I mean, most of the times it worked out fine and they were happy to have me. Okay, well, obviously, yeah, I would think they would be quite happy to have you because, I mean, the performance that you gave is is, is great, really. Um, and I really think that your voice kind of suits the whole vibe, the atmosphere of Half-Life. And if you, you know, probably talk to somebody who is not, the biggest fan of Half-Life, I'm pretty sure they're not going to necessarily see the difference between the voices, you know, the OG voices that you, that you have voiced and, and your voice. So I, I, I've I got that really great uh, a lot. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what my oh, normal great. voices, they compare that often to Dr. Kleiner from Half-Life too, because they, right. they have a similar voice tone. Fellow citizens, residents of City 17 and environs, By which I mean sentient residents, of course, a human and otherwise. Although I believe there is little need to explain recent developments to our Vortigaunt allies. But Overwatch is a completely different voice. It's a female voice. We need to add that. So it's a female voice. So when I do Overwatch, and I haven't done her in a while, but when I do, I really got to go higher and kind of speak like this. Like I'm female and I'm not alive. (laughs) So I got to be monotone. Um, so, you know, that's, that, awesome. that's what I got to wow. do for Overwatch. And it's a lot of fun. That's crazy. That's really great. That's, that requires a lot of talent, 100%. Talking about the podcast, you are a host of, you know, an amazing podcast called the VOC Podcast, VOC, um, that I personally enjoy very, very much. Um, and in that podcast, you, you know, mainly focus on talking to voice actors from the gaming community um, and from the industry. And obviously, I highly recommend to anybody listening and anybody watching to check out the podcast. Um, It will be linked down below. Now, what I'm really interested in is kind of the origin story of the podcast. You know, as a podcaster, to speaking to a podcaster, I want to know the origin (laughs) story. You know, that's very interesting to me. So how did that all start? Well, again, it features Ellen McClain. Well, I was a huge fan of her. And I needed to find a way to, you know, I, I knew... And I still know that I'm probably not going to be meeting her in person. 
And I think I stumbled upon some interviews with her on the internet. And I was like, hmm, maybe I could talk to her on, in like a Zoom call. Th this was at the time of the pandemic, right? So it was pretty convenient, you know, Zoom and everything. So yep. I reached out to her husband on Facebook, actually, believe it or not. And I was able to arrange okay. an interview. But uh, I was this shy kid and I was, you know, afraid. I, I never had the thoughts of having a podcast or anything like that. I just wanted to meet her and tell her how much I love her and, you know, I do this impression and, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, they told me that it would have to be recorded as like an interview. Because, you know, they can't just, you know, connect with everyone in a call because then they would have no time for anything at all. And I understood that, of course. I Got know it. they didn't mean that in a bad way. Yeah. So uh, I knew that I had to have it recorded. And I knew that I couldn't do it alone because I, you know, I, I would be so stressed out. So I needed a friend. And I had the right person at the right time. My uh, co-host, Sam... Uh, entity who um, helped me and has been on the journey with me for a long time. And thanks to him that we have this podcast because, you know, he had his connections and we had a logo, then an animation of the logo and everything. So it's, yeah. And we named it Voke because, you know, of vocal. Uh, so, okay, yeah, which is, you know, it. connects and is real related to voice actors. So uh, I thought it was okay. convenient. Actually, it was Sam's father who came up with the name. It's a, it's pretty. That's funny. awesome, man! Wow, <laughs> that's cool. It's crazy how sometimes you know these origin stories are really something that you didn't intend to do, but it just so happened, and you just went with it. And I think this is the perfect example of that. And and I think it's great. Yeah. Um, wow! Wow! So you reached out to her husband. The husband answered you back. You organized an interview. They told you to make it recorded. And that's where the idea popped up to make the podcast. <laughs> yeah. And after, you know, our talk awesome. with Ellen, uh, we came up like, maybe we could talk to the other Team Fortress 2 voices, like, you know, Heavy Weapons guy right. or whatever. And right. yeah, then we did interview after interview. And now suddenly it's been going on for four years and 48 episodes. And wow. <laughs> yeah, man. Wow. And, and what? Over 3,000 subscribers. Uh, over 7,000 right now, yeah. Um, over 7,000? Hopefully oh, sorry, we'll reach uh, 10,000 this year. But if not, it's not a wonderful. problem. Wonderful. Well, of course, it's not a problem, no, but you have your goals, and hopefully you do reach that and even more. Um, wow, hopefully. What a, what a wonderful story, man. And you know what? Big props to uh, uh, her husband and, and Elaine as well. I mean, they're, they were very kind and uh, helping you kickstart the whole journey with your podcast. That's so wonderful, man. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, it's it's nice to be thankful to my you know idol, and to think that she kind of helped me uh, follow my dreams without me knowing what my dreams were. It's really fascinating. And I'm thankful to her to this day. Obviously, as you mentioned, you've spoken to, you know, some of the most talented voice actors uh, in the industry. And not only talented, but also well known and, you know, really loved by the community. And I think, you know, it is a very Im important thing that you're doing, you know, for the community to let... Um, like all of us know the stories behind these creative individuals and to get them to to get us to know them a little bit better. Um, but, you know, after all the conversations that you have had and you mentioned you had more than, uh, sorry, 48 episodes, um, what is that one takeaway, that one lesson that has resonated with you? What is important to realize is that even these actors, even these celebrities are, you know, normal, humble human beings just like us. I, that's something that I have learned probably in the half of my podcasting journey is that you just got to realize and you you don't necessarily need to treat them like celebrities because that's probably something they don't want. You know, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. they're people just like us. And the fact that they're getting, you know, bigger recognition for their work because that's their field, you know, acting. They're aware that, you know, people are going to uh, recognize them and whatnot. But they just, you know, want to chill around and, you know, make friends and, you know, just be cool with everyone, just like anybody else. So the, so basically what you're saying is one of the most important things when speaking or, you know, being in touch with, with you know, people like that is to simply understand that you and them, both human, all the same, Keep it down to earth and no need to overemphasize things, right? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, 
Exactly. Anything about voice acting? Any any lessons? Any tips? Any uh, you know uh, uh, after people you know you you spoken to people with a lot of more experience than you, so perhaps some one word of advice that they have told you. Um, one thing I get told all the time, and it's probably not an advice, but I keep getting told that I have a unique voice, which I suppose is true. You know, uh, speaking about your voice, and uh, I've mentioned this when we connected prior uh, to, to the podcast episode, I also said that you do have a very unique voice, um, a very interesting voice. Um, but what's also interesting that I uh, would like to know is you're from Slovakia, but you have a really wonderful, you know, American accent. How exactly did that come about? Um, and, um, you know, did you work on it or is it something that, you know, was natural to you? You know, I'm pretty sure I haven't worked on it intentionally. So it was something that came, you know, naturally as I was probably, you know, working on the podcast and doing voiceover. So it probably came naturally. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure this really goes... Uh, uh, as a big advantage in your it is it is uh, definitely in, in your a huge pursuit advantage. of voice acting because the voices that you that you voice you know are predominantly American actors, um, and in in American games. So yeah, I think it, it, it's really you know wonderful. Um, but also speaking to the to the uniqueness of your voice, I think that's what kind of puts you aside from you know anyone else, right? I think kind of differentiates you from anybody else, and I think that's also a really big advantage. That you might have. It but could be. You have also mentioned that it might be a disadvantage, right? <laughs> yes. Um, it it why, could why? be a disadvantage. How so? um, because then, you know, if my voice is really distinct, really distinct. So even if I would do a different voice, people could probably recognize it, which in some cases is an advantage. And in other cases, it's a disadvantage. Because the job of the actor is to make your voice sound different. A lot of the times, you know, some actors gotcha. or, or voices uh, appear in the same project and they do multiple characters, you know, I don't know, at the beginning and then at the end of the, you know, game or whatever. So they do multiple characters with different voices. And the point there is for the players not to recognize them. But even if I, you know, speak in an American accent or if I speak in a British accent, it sounds the same. <laughs> oh, man, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm just getting fascinated by the way you uh, manipulate your voice. I understand what you're saying. Uh, so it's 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 a blessing and a curse at the same time. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's the voice that you're born with. So you'll make do. Oh, I'm not you know, complaining. To as much benefit course. as possible. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're not complaining. Of course, that's the most important thing. <laughs> you know, just to continue our conversation, you know, specifically about the voice and kind of, you know, to stay in the same theme of things. Uh, could you kind of walk, uh, you know, us through the process of creating, you know, distinct voices for the different characters in, you know, the different um, games that you voice? Uh, you've mentioned that, you know, you have a certain, um, you have a unique voice that is that that is hard to differentiate, but yet you play different characters in these different uh, games. So how exactly do you go about doing that? Well, creating distinct voices, I mean, that isn't really, you know, my job. Uh, when I'm impersonating someone, you know, I know what to go for. And in those cases, I, I suppose I save that trouble, you know, uh, for myself. So in those cases, you know, <laughs> if I do a scientist, I'll just go higher because that is the voice that the character is in. But if I'm right, doing a security right. guard and, you know, I know his performance is very monotone, then I'll just be like, hey, Mr. Freeman. What's up? I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago, you know. And yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, so, the, you know, to, different, to differentiate the uh, characters and the voices, it's important to, you know, not just try to make yourself sound different, but to give off a completely different performance. It's not real to say something as the character that you know they wouldn't say. Exactly, exactly. You know, if I, would, if I were to close my eyes... And I were to just listen to your voice in those different tones and think of those characters, it makes perfect, like they're, it's so perfectly in line. Um, and, you know, I think if Half-Life 3 is ever going to become a thing, I think Valve should take a look at, at, at your work. <laughs> I think Valve should take note, honestly speaking. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate that you're being so nice, but that would not be possible even if I wanted it to. How so? 
Um, uh, you know, there's this uh, union called SAG-AFTRA, which is the Screen Actors Guild in the United States. Uh, okay. And uh, for an actor to be in, you know, an official project like that, it's important to be a part of that union. And you pay dues there and whatnot, and not everybody gets in. But you need to reside in the United States. Um, okay, that's something that I didn't know. So wait, so you're saying if 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 Valve were, you know, let's say uh, theoretically to uh, launch Half Life Three, the pr- production for Half Life Three, they could only hire actors that are members of the of the union. Yeah, uh, unless if they went non-union, which is possible as well. But in that case, you know, they would save themselves a lot of money with not having to pay union actors because actors that are in the union, there's a, uh, you know, they have to be paid a certain amount. So, you know, okay. there's those rules, I suppose, uh, as opposed to non-union actors who, you know, they would get paid m- much less. But Valve probably won't do that. I know Capcom did it, but I'm not sh- I don't think Valve is gonna do that. Uh, what in your opinion would be the reason for you know Valve, for example, uh, going the route of union actors, is it the fact that there's more talented actors in the union, or I don't think that's necessarily uh, the case. But um, for them to just have to go through an agency, or you know, they're based in Seattle, from what I know, and it's right. easier for them to go through an agency uh, that you know has union actors as opposed to having to find the the non-union actors. I'm I'm not sure if there's an agency for non-union actors, but I know that there's an agency, you know, within Seattle that, you know, has uh, union actors. And it's easier for Valve to just go through them and, uh, you know, make a selection and listen to the voice reel demos of the the people and, you know, to send auditions. It's it's much easier for them to do it that way. And they, you know, quality is assured. They know that they're getting I actors see. in that know what they're doing. I see. Usually, I see. So, going the union route is more expensive, but you're guaranteed to find what you're looking for, and it's faster. Going the non-union union route is uh, cheaper, but you just have to really search and, and and find, and kind of it's more time consuming. So, what you're saying is companies opt to use the union route just because uh, it, it saves them. You know the hassle of searching and 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 whatnot, correct? Oh, I I think so, definitely, yes. Oh wow, that's interesting. Well, hey, I mean, look, hopefully, maybe one day you might become <laughs> part of the union. Why not? Maybe. Who knows? I mean, I don't have any knows, plans of moving to the states. And even people in the union, you know, they have to pay dues. And if they're not getting any work for whatever reason, you know, unless they they have a second job, because no actor. And I assure you, no actor can, you know, live from just voice acting and acting on camera because there's never enough work for everyone. Oh, wow, man. You just uh, struck a interesting uh, conversation here. So wait a minute. Um, so for example, if I'm a, com- a company that's making a video game and I have a certain character that requires a certain, for example, accent or perhaps a certain language, then, uh, for example, I don't know, a Spanish-speaking person or whatever, uh, if that person does not reside in the US and is not part of the union, then I won't be able to search for that person. I'll have to do it myself, as you said, the long route. They, they scout, um, scout from Spain. I'm pretty sure that there actually are um, agencies that uh, you know work with um, people who reside in the US and do speak Spanish or you know whatever. So there are you know agencies like that. For sure. Interesting, interesting. Wow, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, there's definitely a lot to get into. Uh, I mean, it's something completely new for me. Um, but uh, at least you gave me kind of the, the overview of the situation. And now I understand, wow, that's, um, it's tough huh? To for, for actors to, to, to be part of the union, to pay their dues, and to also work. Um, yeah, it's a tough... Um, tough situation to be in wow damn. yeah that is why you know most actors need to have a second job you know whether it's directing writing or even you know working in a restaurant because actors do that and they're forced to do it if there's not enough work wow okay well i think we can speak for another hour just about that because i have so many questions and <laughs> that i would like to get your opinion on but uh, not to uh go on a crazy tangent here let's just let's just uh 
end the conversation there about that. That's very interesting. I'll try to do some research myself as well uh, into the subject because I, I find it fascinating. It is very interesting indeed. But speaking of you know challenges, right? Uh, that's probably a perfect segue to my next question here. Um, what challenges have you faced, you know, as 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 a voice actor or while performing, um, you know, certain roles in, in in the characters that you have voiced, and how exactly do you overcome them? Well, challenges for me are especially you know dialects and accents. Um, they're difficult, especially some, you know, specific ones. Um, over my, you know, four-year-long journey of doing voiceover and whatnot, I have been able to, you know, like you said, make this American accent or neutral accent, I would say, because it's not totally mm-hmm. American. So I was able to, right. you know, kind of um, make this work. Then, you know, I've trained a British, British and whatnot from just from what I heard and that kind of stuff. That but again, so good. My God. even in Britain, there's a lot of, you know, accents. There's all sorts of, you know, the yeah. RP and, you know, so um, it's it's a lot. And then there's, you know, Scottish and all these accents, Indian, Russian. There's a lot of accents. Some of them are very difficult, believe it or not. Yeah, I would assume so. But trust me, I, I fully believe you. <laughs> I, I can't. But even in, you it. know, the States, there's New York, there's, you know, the Midwest, there's... Right. Uh, even Canadians the have some accent. sort of an accent. The southern, yeah. yeah, the southern. They're fun to do it once you'll, you know, you're fully on with it. But uh, yeah. So, um, how exactly do you go about learning a certain accent if you do it? Is it just practice, right? Practice, yeah. Or if I have a reference of a character, you know, from a video game or whatever, a character th- that I like, then you know, as I listen to them a lot, I probably get a bit of their, you know. Um, accent touch or whatnot, you know, like, um, Mm -hmm. hmm, let's see, like the administrator from Team Fortress 2, you know, she has the uh, British RP. And so whenever I I am doing the administrator, I just go, you failed. Um, Yeah, maybe there wasn't (laughs) a lot of RP in that, but, uh, you know, so that that is where I have that accent. That's wonderful, man. You know, I got to say, you're the first... uh you know, voice actor that I have the honor to speak to and just, you know, speaking to whenever you do these impressions, it's just like, uh, it, it's really impressive. I got to say, it's it's really impressive. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the conversation. I got to say. <laughs> oh, that's kind of you. So from, um, you know, the work that you've done so far, what has been the most rewarding project um, and, and why? Most rewarding project. Not money wise, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> most rewarding well, project, um, probably this podcast I did. It's an audio drama kind of podcast called Dark Dice. It's a medieval kind of thingy, and uh, the I reason I saw that, yeah, yeah. The reason yeah. why I find that the most rewarding project of all the work I did, because I was in that with um, you know award-winning Hollywood actor Jeff Goldblum, and he was in you know. Mm. Uh, um, of course. Uh, the, 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 what's it called? Um, about the dinosaurs. Jeez. Yeah, the Jurassic dinosaurs. Park, no? yeah. It's not coming into my head right now either, but uh, he was in that, you know. And, Jurassic Park. Um, yeah, Jurassic Park. And he was a huge, you know, he is a huge actor. And I did not know yeah, he was humongous. in it, you know. So um, Really? And, and we were in the same episode. I don't think we were talking to each other, but, you know, just the fact that I'm, you know, in the same credits as him, that's a huge thing for me. Correct. I would recommend thy place of worship. It is a pleasant enough place for those who wishing not to be bothered who have coin. Uh, it is not actually a place of worship, uh, and the password is commoner. Oh, I'm a commoner seeking prayer. That is really wonderful. I saw that on your IMDb page, and I clicked on it, and I didn't fully understand what it was, and I kind of didn't really pay a lot of attention to it, but now that you're telling me that... <laughs> you know, such A-class actors were, were involved. Uh, so what is it, once again, what type of a podcast is it? It's an audio drama podcast based in the medieval times. Um, yeah, I was in one episode of that, but I have worked together with the creator on another podcast, which is called The Boar Knight, where I voiced a shrimp. A shrimp. A, a shrimp. And... I, oh I didn't, God. that's actually an interesting topic because, you know, I didn't know what voice to do for a shrimp. Like, what voice would I do? And, you know, then I remember <laughs> the scientist. Question. 
Yeah. The science is from Half-Life. And I was like, all right, let's get to it. Let's move, 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 move. So, you know, it's it's cute <laughs> little shrimp. So I didn't know what to what voice to come up with, and I thought that worked well. And you know, the creator was thankful for that voice. I am Petite Micro, leader of the iridescent microbrine shrimp. That kelp stock was in our lands for generations. Wow, I I fully agree. You you know what? For like you said, you have a very um unique voice. But for a person with a unique voice, you really have uh. What's the correct word to say? Like a different uh, notes in your voice? I don't, I, I don't know how to correctly say it, but you really, you change the voice a lot. And it, it's not really, you know, I think it's quite um, quite remarkable what you can do. It's really like the shrimp makes perfect sense with that voice. I don't know how the shrimp looks like or anything. It's only my imagination. I, I don't know. I have sense. not. There's no artwork or anything. It's a podcast, right? It's, there's, it's okay. audio only. So the only artwork that I get to see wow. usually is the cover art of the podcast. Awesome. And who did you play um, in the other one? In The Dark Dice, I played a yeah. salesman, a young salesman. But uh, I don't think I have had too much of a different voice because it was still me. I was just putting on like an accent. And I was okay. like, yes, my sister was killed. I'm so sad now. I don't know what to do. Something like that. You know, audiobooks would also be pretty interesting. Oh, audiobooks. Definitely no. No. That, that's nice of you to say, but believe it or not, audiobooks are a lot of work. A lot. Uh, so, Ronald, tell me, are there any dream projects or franchises that you would love to lend your voice in in the future? Hmm. Dreams. They're, they will just, you know, stay dreams. But it'd be nice to be in a Half-Life game or any game from Valve. Um, it'd be nice to be in a Grand Theft well, Auto. You know what? Uh, just to just to boost you up a little bit, boost your energy. Hey, don't say that, man. You never know. You never know. I never know. You know, I mean, I don't know what opportunities life will bring. So I suppose you're right. But uh, it, it feels kind of um, impossible at the moment. At the moment, it feels impossible. Understood. 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 Well, there's always hope. So you said any uh, Valve game and a GTA game, right? A GTA or Rocks even a Resident game. Evil. Because, you know, Resident Evil, especially since the remakes, I think, they went non-union Capcom. So that is, you know, the mm -hmm. mo most possible option. The only projects, the projects that I could actually be featured in if they ever found me or something. A <laughs> uh, quick question. Uh for example, if you want to aim to work for Capcom, do you need to have an agent? Or what? what is your strategy, for example, to uh, get them to look at your work or for them to notice you? I would probably need to have an agent, which I don't so far. So uh, tell me, what do you think are you know the key qualities that make a successful voice actor? I think a successful voice actor should be versatile, right? should be able to do all sorts of voices, uh, accents, dialects. And, you know, one very important part of uh, voiceover is clear speech and the pronunciation of words. So if a voice actor, you know, has all that down and, you know, he can change his voice and, you know, act out the different emotions, then you're all set. Got it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Definitely not not really easy things to to achieve, but definitely um, you know. All you gotta do from then on, things. then on, is to you know find work. If right. you have an agent, if <laughs> if, if you done. get an agent, then you're lucky. If you don't, then you have all these skills, but it's difficult for you to make use of them. Right. But the agent, of course, takes a part of your purse, right? Oh, they do. They do indeed. Oh, they do. <laughs> but they they're but the ones who get you the work reason. yeah exactly exactly or you could go exactly. go up to um sites such as you know casting call club or voices.com but they're usually got to pay uh, you know to these sites uh just like to an agent that you got to pay to them and you know they usually take a percentage of your uh of your you know work and the money that you make so yeah Okay. Everything so either comes either way, at a risk. but at least they, they, right? But at least they give you exposure, and and I think yeah, I guess it's worth it at the end of the day. I suppose, yeah. I haven't tried it, but uh, I think you know maybe they really get you work. Yeah, probably. Well, so right now you don't have an uh, an agent, correct? 
I don't. I don't. I'm kind of a, an agent for myself, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I heard stories where where actors uh, or even voice actors, they're just, you know, kind of, as you said, agents for themselves and it's working out, you know, perfectly well, well for them. It just depends on the opportunities that come that you come across, really. I'm really interested uh, in this question because, you know, you post uh, videos of you reenacting scenes from, you know, certain video games. And one that really, you know, caught my eye and my attention was where you reenact Chris from, or Chris Redfield, sorry, from Resident Evil 5. Welcome to Africa. My name is Sheva Alamon. Chris Redfield. Your reputation precedes you, Mr. Redfield. It's an honor. Just Chris, thanks. Uh, can you tell me, is that something you just do for practice, you know, to practice your voiceover work? Um, or is it something you do for fun? And how long does it take to kind of fully get in sync with, you know, the character's movements? Well, you know, I mean, it was just for the fun at the time because I was actually interviewing the voice of Sheva Alomar from Resident Evil 5. So I thought it'd be pretty cool if we, you know, reenacted a scene. But um, the point here was to make Sheva say those lines again. I was just there because I didn't have Roger Craig Smith to do Chris. So I <laughs> had to step in and fill, you know, the shoes of Roger Craig Smith, which was a hard thing to do. But I think I, you know. Right. I did okay. No, you did definitely did well. So, so wait. So, in that recording, it's actually her reenacting the part together with you. Yes. Oh wow, man, that's wonderful. What was that experience like? Feels, I mean, to to work alongside, you know, um, you know, a veteran in 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 the industry. <laughs> you know, it's or to just practice fun. alongside. It's just fun. Right. It was fun. It it was really fun. And actually, we didn't, you know, sync up with the actual cut scene. We just read it and. Uh, it happened to fit oh. exactly with the, with you know the movement and the characters and everything. The mouth. That's awesome. And yeah, it was it was fun. It's, it's so great that you know she's kind enough to do that. You know, and and that's just such a wonderful thing from her to do. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> it's more well, incredible you see, that you guys didn't sync it up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was an interesting uh, activity to do in the podcast since I you know interview. Uh, actors and voice actors and I usually would ask them questions but I had to come up with an activity something to make it interesting right. but in, you know right. funny for the viewers at the same time so reenacting scenes from the game or mm, come up with new voice lines and you know have the actor say it in the character voice was just fun I thought it was a good idea absolutely and you know I made use of it so you know we're, we're, we're closing into the to the end uh, of the podcast here um what advice would you give to aspiring voice actors, you know, that are, you know, kind of just starting in their careers um, and trying to get their heads into the industry? Perhaps, you know, people who are um, not exactly certain whether they should do it or not. And, you know, also for um, people who are just interested to risk it and to try it, like you did in a way, right? You didn't know that you wanted it, you risked it, you tried it, and you found a passion in it. So... What would be those few words of advice for them? Practice, practice, and practice. <laughs> Definitely practice. Um, Don't unless, forget practice. <laughs> yeah, unless I got lucky because I, you know, I had uh, the friend of my brother who was the director, so I. That's how I was introduced to acting and you know all that. But unless you have someone like that in your family or close to you, it's probably gonna be hard. And I mean. Go to, you know, take acting lessons um, and stuff like that. Really get coached and you'll get there because there are uh, lessons like that. You know, even on the Internet, you can, you know, just um, practice and uh, you'll get there sooner or later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely makes uh, makes perfect sense. Right? Practice, practice, practice. Definitely uh, one of the most important things. If you don't want to really, you know, take acting lessons and whatnot and you if you are talented then you'll get work eventually because there's a lot of hollywood actors who never had acting lessons and they you know um, never never studied it and yet they're in hollywood so keep that in mind yeah definitely yeah also um you know just persevere right patience would be probably the key uh thing as well for sure well anyways to any of you uh who are into the in, into voice acting and good luck <laughs> yeah good from, luck to you all. me for sure from us <laughs>
uh, you know, I have a run, you know, uh, uh, an ongoing segment, you know, in, in on the podcast where my previous guest asks a question to my current guest, and um, my previous guest Travis asks. So, uh, the question that I want to say is, if if they weren't doing um, the career they're doing now, what would be their backup? Hmm, that's a good question, but I have a very right. short answer to that. Because if I wasn't <laughs> acting and, you know, doing voiceover, I probably would be singing, probably. And if I wouldn't be singing, then I would just probably, you know, um, focus on, you know, studying. You know, I'm studying marketing, so I would probably focus and stay in that, uh, uh, in that uh, you know, <clears throat> field. Awesome. Well, that's cool. And in marketing, do you have a specific, um, you know, path of, of what you're interested in there's there's different branches of, of marketing uh probably social media marketing that's something that i can right. you know use to um help myself and get out to the world as well got it yeah 100 percent, absolutely 100 percent. well with that said uh you know we need to keep the tradition going uh i would like you if i may ask you to uh leave a question for my future guest please i think my question would be Ooh, that's a that's a very interesting question. <laughs> I can't I can't wait for someone else to answer it. Um, and one 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 final question, just to uh, uh, because I'm really curious. I asked this question to all of my guests. What is a video game for you? A video game for me uh, means a lot of things. It's a kind of you know um, escape from reality. A lot of times, it's something that. Uh, uh, makes you think of different stuff at a time. I'm I'm really enjoying video games, and I have been enjoying them ever since I was a kid. And whenever I play a video game, I feel different. I feel like I'm I you know I can really get immersed in the game. And when that happens, you know, it's just all up to you to um, enjoy it. And um, I don't like the people who who think video games are you know um, sort of addicting kind of stuff because right, what right. isn't addicting these days anything you know could be called addicting but video mm. games are really just different from movies because you can enjoy them and you decide what happens uh, i can i can fully relate to to your to your answer the funny thing is there's no real incorrect answer to this question it's just a person's perspective about video games and i'm lucky enough to speak to people who are really into video games and just getting to know all these answers is really, um, you know, a wonderful thing. And thank you so much for that. <laughs> With that said, uh, thank you so much, Ronald, for, you know, being on the podcast, for uh, finding the time to talk to me, for opening up, for being on camera. That's a, that's a first for you. So thank you for that very, very much. It was very interesting for me to speak to you. I've learned a lot, as I always do with all my guests. And uh, I wish you, you know, nothing but the very best in your journey to pursue your dream, to pursue your passion. I hope it's going to be in the field that you love, which is voice acting. Uh, I hope perhaps to hear your voice someday in in a big game with, with a very uh, important character. And until that day, I hope you learn. I hope you get wiser. I hope you overcome all the obstacles and, you know, just get better and better and eventually reach the goal that you set for yourself. So thank you so very much for being on the podcast today. That's so nice of you, Gacha, to say. And if I may uh, say a farewell to your viewers as well, if you allow me. Absolutely. Um, of course. <clears throat> Keep listening to Pixel Fabula. If you don't, <laughs> I will find you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Probably, probably the best ending to the podcast episode I've ever had, man. Thank you so very much, Ronald. <laughs> Are you being too kind? Well, you know, we've had our technical awesome. difficulties, so we might as well end it off with. Uh... Yeah, tell me about the technical difficulties. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Much.